My dad, Larry Lynn, the only true servant leader willing to stand in the arena and fight for your freedoms. Larry is a man of God and he will move heaven and earth to protect the people in district. Too many elected politicians act like chameleons. My name is Mike. I'm Larry's neighbor. I, I bought the house behind him. I trust Larry to give me an honest answer. Uh, and what's important to me is faith, family, and my freedom. And I believe these values are also held by Larry Linton. More important than ever, I believe, in our lifetime to really stand up and fight for what's right. And Larry's doing that, and I'm bored of it. We need to replace career politicians in Nashville with leaders willing to stand for what is right, even if it's not popular. People who feel a calling and are not looking to make a profession out of it. You're not going to find a more um, honest, straightforward, and passionate individual, I don't believe. Larry is what you see is what you get. He's on. Listen, if you are looking for a true conservative, who's passionate about the state of Tennessee, the people that live in it, and wanting to make a difference in a meaningful way, Larry's your guy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, a reminder that this will be the last new episode until the 9th of December. As I discussed last week, and based upon my schedule, upcoming surgery, as well as the Thanksgiving holiday, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off from producing content for the podcast. I will, however, continue to share material on my website and social media pages, so please give them a follow. Also, if you listen to this show on Apple or Spotify, please give it a review on those platforms. Smash that like button on YouTube or Rumble as well, and also subscribe to the show on those platforms so you get a notification whenever a show is released there. Right now, I'm back in Riverton, Wyoming, spending time with the crews here in this area before we both take a break for the Thanksgiving holiday. I'm getting closer to locking in a guest appearance on the show by one of East Tennessee's pastors who really embodies the principles of the Black Robe Regiment. More to follow as that develops, though. The liberal tears continue to flow all over the country, despite nobody's rights being taken away by President-elect Donald Trump, and that is because of the toxic leadership cultivated by the mainstream media in our republic. That isn't to say that some of the people's rights have not been taken away, but the commies and their allies in the bureaucratic or, or deep state and their willing partners in legacy mainstream media have been doing that for years already without a peep from the blue-haired cat ladies and the prototypical white dudes for Harris crowds. There have been a couple of disturbing trends on social media coming from the left that I believe could be a win-win for society, even though the commies and the commie sympathizers don't view it that way. So we'll talk about that. Trends, though, that are encouraged by the toxic leadership of the commies, as well as the commie sympathizers in the legacy mainstream media. And since I did not get to or have time to get into last week, We'll discuss trans public in Tennessee Governor Bill Lee and his henchmen in the General Assembly being untruthful and toxic in their leadership. So imagine my surprise. It all has to do with House Bill 1 and Senate Bill 1 that they introduced for the 114th General Assembly that convenes in January. The first untruth, or lie, is in the title of the bill and has been named the Education Freedom Act of 2025. You know, two traits of leadership that destroy organizations are toxic environments and being untruthful, meaning untrustworthy. So leadership toxicity, untruthful leaders, a discussion about Sevier County a little bit, all that and more on this week's episode of Liberty, Leadership, and Lies. So let's get on with this week's show and take a stand in the arena together again this week, folks. Welcome to the Liberty, Leadership, and Lies podcast. On this show, we will discuss the assaults on our liberty by the very institution we the people created to secure our liberty. We will also compare and contrast the actions of people in leadership positions to the servant leadership that is needed to protect our God-given, constitutionally protected rights. Additionally, we will break down the many lies that elected 
and unelected officials in government and media spin every day in order to secure for themselves positions of power and influence that are antithetical to the system of government our founding fathers created and passed down to us. Again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, I'm back in Riverton, Wyoming this morning after spending the past week alternating my time between Casper and Gillette, Wyoming. I experienced more snowfall last week in both locations, but not enough to make travel hazardous. Between working out in the field and doing some classroom training, it was a very productive week. Did not have a lot of time to follow uh, some of the major news stories breaking on the national level, other than the left's visceral reactions to some of President-elect Trump's cabinet picks that are really demonstrative of the results of the toxic and untruthful leadership in the legacy mainstream media. But the liberal tears, they've been delicious, so to speak. Now, I know that not everybody on the conservative or MAGA side of the political spectrum will be happy with all of Trump's selections, but I must tell you that I believe each pick has a second, third, and maybe even fourth order effect outside of what we are seeing in the media. There are some people that are noticing what is going on with these selections and sharing them on X, which, by the way, Elon Musk's purchase of that social media platform and his position of being a free speech absolutist played what I consider to be the largest role in President Trump's reelection, something that ties into the title of this week's show. Anyway, an account that I follow on X stated the not so obvious second or, or maybe third order effect of these cabinet selections, and that would be about the Senate's constitutional advise and consent role. More specifically, the Senate confirmation process that the citizens we've really just become numb to. Many of President Trump's selections are people that the communists despise, mainly because they will assist the MAGA movement by making the national government smaller and more accountable to we the people. The talking heads in the legacy mainstream media ecosphere are labeling them as not qualified based upon their criteria, which for the most part is that they are not part of the Washington, D.C. establishment, or if they've been in D.C. for any significant period of time, it has been to fight against the explosive growth of central government size and power. The legacy mainstream media, which is filled primarily with communists for decades now, its leadership, both in show hosts and corporate owners, it became toxic to constitutional principles because they have been so used to being the primary source for news and information in our republic. They completely understand the concept of control the narrative, control the outcome. Well, alternate social media sites have flipped the script on that. There's some podcasts that share truthful information now that have vastly larger audiences than both broadcast and cable news media. These communists lost control of the narrative. Many of those podcasts have a social media presence on X, and they're no longer muted, shadow banned, or even censored, thanks to Elon Musk. Now that he is in control of that platform, truthful news and information is making its way to the people. No longer does the legacy mainstream media control the narrative, and you see what results that can produce, the re-election of Donald Trump, not only within the electoral college landslide, but also winning the popular vote. Donald Trump knows that the communists, both in government and in the mainstream media, no longer control the narrative, and his selections are another front that he opened on the political battlefield. These choices are his way of saying he wants this fight and he wants it to be very public. These nominations, again, this may be a third order effect. They may very well be one of the greatest civics lessons in our republic's history. Definitely the biggest civics lesson of the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, what would that lesson be? Well, it will demonstrate that the power in this nation really does belong to we the people. And President Trump just won a massive mandate through the Electoral College landslide and popular vote against the D.C. establishment pick of Kamala Harris. These nomination fights will be over whether or not a president gets to choose his cabinet to run the executive branch of the national government. It is all about the separation of powers. 
The Senate has encroached on this presidential power with regards to appointments for decades, if not for more than two centuries now. The founding fathers, in writing the Constitution, gave the Senate, you know, the Chamber of Congress that is supposed to represent the states, not the individual people. That's the function of the House of Representatives. But the Senate and the president have shared power to appoint judges and civil officers. Nothing has changed in the Constitution to alter that power. However, the way the Senate has exercised that power has dramatically changed over time. In the first decade of governance under the Constitution, the Senate established the practice of senatorial courtesy, by which the senators expected to be consulted on all nominees to federal posts within their states. It just may be that after the fight over these nominations, Congress, specifically the Senate, will no longer be able to prevent a president overwhelmingly elected by the people from fulfilling his promises by appointing the people he chooses for his cabinet. Now, going back in history, the Senate's role and influence in the filling of federal positions within the government, it empowered senators, many of whom later went on to be leaders of the political parties that started to emerge in the early 19th century. By the end of the 19th century, though, presidents and senators began to clash over the control of these lower-level federal government positions. That is when there began to be calls for some sort of reform by people that distrusted the political parties. And rightly so, as we've seen now what kind of mess the two major parties have gotten us into. These reformers wanted to reduce the number of positions subject to political patronage and, and the advice and consent role of the Senate. As the federal government grew, thanks to their tapping into the wallets and bank accounts of every American because of the 16th Amendment, the number of these appointments grew as well. It wasn't until the 80s when Congress passed legislation that reduced the number of positions requiring confirmation in the Senate. A key point to keep in mind, though, is that this process started out as senatorial courtesy, not Senate quote unquote, approval. With these appointments and the call for the uh, so-called recess appointments made by President Trump, he is taking us back to the original Constitution. In short, Donald Trump is set on reigning in the Congress's encroachment on the executive branch, a restoration of the separation of powers doctrine that is contained in our Constitution. I'm not totally sure if that is the second or third order effect again, but these appointments, when you compare it to another effect. However, through the legacy mainstream media's reaction, along with several of the entrenched in D.C. from both political parties that serve as quote-unquote advisors to those news programs, it shows the American people, especially those who overwhelmingly voted for Trump, the kind of toxic and untruthful leadership these organizations provide to the constitutional governance of this republic. They have propped up that establishment, which is big central government, propped up that mindset for centuries now, instead of fulfilling their role in holding government accountable. Accountable to not only the citizens of this great nation, but also accountable to the form and function of the federal government established by the Constitution. But what is the other effect, you may ask? Well, I believe that President Trump's selections are revealing who, within the Republican Party, as well as some of those so-called moderates, who supports the president in carrying out the mandate provided to him by we the people. A few of his nominations have these uh, trans-publicans along with their Communists and their useful idiots in the entertainment and legacy mainstream media, these nominations have resulted in apocalyptic responses. If you want to gauge the effectiveness of a tactic used in combat, you must observe how the enemy reacts to it. The enemy, or enemies in this case, would be every single communist elected member of government, plus every talking head on cable news, broadcast news, or internet news organizations. You can throw in the Hollywood and music industry for added measure, although we already know that those people will side with the communists. When the opposition reveals themselves by their visceral reactions to these announcements, you know who to target within your own party for replacement in the next round of elections. 
you hold them accountable. So keep looking for those people within the Republican Party, ladies and gentlemen. Also, email your federal senators as well and urge them to support President Trump's nominations. Let them know that you are watching and you will remember all of their actions during their next election. While members of the House of Representatives do not have a direct role in the nomination and quote-unquote confirmation of appointees, they do have an indirect role to play. Most of them are quite comfortable appearing on the weekend news shows or podcasts and you need to let them know that they have a platform on which to publicly support the president and his nominations. Tell them that you expect the Republican delegations from your state to encourage the Senate to support each one of these nominations. That's it for this segment. So I went a bit long there, but I believe it is important that we all know how our Constitution is designed to guide governance in this republic. A task that government education has epically failed, on purpose too, a task that government schools epically failed at when educating our children. In the next segment, we'll discuss how trans-publican governor Billy is at it again, going all in on attempting to purchase a legacy for himself and purchase it with our tax dollars. We'll also discuss a couple of dark social media trends. They are very dark, but... Like I said in the introduction, I believe they are a win-win for the MAGA movement. So stick with me. I'll be right back. All right, folks. If you thought trans-publican Tennessee Governor Bill Lee would go quietly and give up on his tyranny, you thought wrong. One of the main reasons that the governor continues to double down on his artful lie legislation titled Education Freedom Act is that he has been enabled by the feckless transpublican leadership of the Tennessee General Assembly. With people like House Speaker Cameron Sexton, House Majority Leader William Lamberth, Senate Majority Leader Jack Johnson, and Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally, you have a perfect storm for the implementation of tyrannical, non-Republican governments here in the state of Tennessee. These elected, quote-unquote, Republicans have repeatedly failed. Despite calls from a vast majority of Tennesseans, they have failed to put forth any legislation that would restrict the type of actions that Bill Lee engaged in during the pandemic. They allowed Governor Lee to call for a special session of the General Assembly that transferred taxpayer dollars to support multi-billion dollar corporations and sports teams. They also allowed the governor to call for a special session of the General Assembly that sought to restrict the people's constitutionally protected, God-given right to keep and bear arms. Thankfully, enough Tennesseans spoke up during that special session that no meaningful liberty robbing legislation was signed into law. They also supported the governor's call during the 113th General Assembly to pass legislation that would allow the government to unconstitutionally use tax dollars to bribe citizens to purchase freedom from the government's controlled education system. That purchase would also blur the lines between government education and private sector education, as well as homeschooling all across the state. You know, as a leadership coach, I often coach on a leader's reward power base. Fundamentally, that means when you reward or publicly recognize good behavior, you often get more of it. The inverse is true, too. When you do not, quote unquote, punish or hold accountable bad behavior, you get more of that. That is a universal leadership truth. It goes from parenting all the way up to the president of the United States. Governor Lee has never been held accountable for his tyrannical actions. So guess what? He engages in more of those actions, which leads us up to House Bill 1, Senate Bill 1, that has already been introduced for the 114th General Assembly, which convenes this coming January. The House bill was filed by none other than William Lambert, and the Senate Companion Bill was filed by Jack Johnson. They both filed this thing the day after the election, when it was very clear that President Trump won that election, 
And part of his platform has been school choice. Now, I'm not aware of any specific plan that has been introduced by President Trump, but he did campaign on the concept of school choice. Now, I'll be placing the link to the Tennessee bill in the description of this episode, and I'll also push it out on my website if you're interested in reading the bill for yourself. But I want to point out how Bill Lee and comrades are being toxic and untruthful in their marketing of this bill to make it palatable to Tennesseans. It's more of the same old, same old from your typical politician that feeds and sustain themselves off the sweat equity of the citizens. I don't have a whole lot of time to break down the whole bill, but just let's break down a few of the untruthful whereas statements in the bill's opening, along with a couple other tidbits. The first whereas statement is this, whereas publicly supported educational freedom has a long history in Tennessee with the HOPE scholarship providing funding that follows students to the public or private institution of their choice. Now, what that statement leaves out, and on purpose too, is that the HOPE scholarship's funding comes from the lottery, not tax dollars. So yes, publicly supported, but not through tax revenue. This is stated in the bill to purposely conflate the phrase publicly supported to get the average citizen to believe we already use tax dollars to support a form of school choice. They're counting on our apathy, folks. Now, the next whereas statement is this. Whereas, parents should be free to choose the school that best feeds the educational needs of their specific child. Now, this statement is in there to uh, fool the people into believing that they currently are not free to choose the best school or education system for their children. Now, keep in mind, there are three distinct types of education systems, public or government schools. There's also private schools and home schools. These are the three primary systems. We've discussed that before and how that is a blatant untruth about the choice between the three. Every parent right now does have a choice. Except that government action over decades has created a monopoly on the quote-unquote free education system, which is kind of a self-owned if you really think about it. Often, when something is free, what is the quality of that something, be it a product or service? Low costs and free items also mean low quality. What is the quality of free education right now? Well, you all know the answer to that, right? So parents, though, they can already choose between the three types of education systems right now. The next untruthful whereas statement is this. Whereas the Education Freedom Scholarship Act will empower parents with the freedom to choose the right education for their child and provide parents a say in where their tax dollars are spent. Well, this Education Freedom Scholarship Act also provides parents a say in not only where their tax dollars are spent, but also the tax dollars of every Tennessean because the amounts of these scholarships far exceed the amount of taxes that a parent or parents pay into during the year. And that number goes up for each individual student. It isn't one set amount for every member of the family. So flat out untrues in the bill's opening. And that's all done to make this liberty robbing legislation palatable to an uncurious and apathetic public. It also provides the state senators and state representatives the appropriate amount of cover when they're home in their districts to sell the bill. But as those infomercial salesmen always are saying, that's not all, folks. First, let me ask the audience this question. During Governor Lee's last attempt at purchasing this legislation in 2024, which constituency did he receive the most pushback from? I mean, besides the communists. Anybody care to venture a guess? Well, if you're thinking the teachers and the teachers' unions, you would be correct. Well, there's a part of this bill that provides an incentive for that constituency to put aside their principles. What is the primary method, outside of coercion with a threat of force or incarceration, that the government uses to obtain compliance from the citizens. Anybody? Yeah, correct. They bribe them with their own money. Now, here's a part of the bill that lays out the bribe. Quote, 
subject to appropriation, the Department of Education shall award a one-time bonus in the amount of $2,000 to each teacher employed in a kindergarten through grade 12 public school in the state for the 2024-2025 school year, end quote. Now, it's curious. Let's just see how many teachers will abandon their so-called principles in favor of more money from the taxpayers. Same thing for the teachers union, the Tennessee Education Association or TEA. Will they somehow encourage their members to advocate for the passage of this bill by stating they helped to negotiate this little bump of money? On that note, and specifically for the voters in House District 12 here in Tennessee, do not forget that the Democrat-controlled TEA supported my main quote-unquote Republican opponent in the August primary. The same guy that has not gone on record in opposition to this voucher scheme. Which way do you think he is going to go on this bill? A bill introduced by William Lamberth that provided Fred Ashley with a large campaign donation from his political action committee. Now, it isn't just the teachers in the teachers union these trans publicans are attempting to bribe with our money. No, they are also bribing the individual county commissions all across the state with our tax dollars as well. So they can get their support for this, right? You've heard of government food stamps, right? This program, I'm going to refer to it as school stamps. Shout out to Kelly for giving me that idea. Because it's just another taxpayer-funded entitlement program like food stamps. This statement comes from another part of the bill. First, though, an explanation of some of the acronyms I'm going to state in this part of the bill. An LEA is a local education agency, such as the Sevier County Board of Education, which has its budget approved by the county commission. And TISA, T-I-S-A, is the funding formula used by the state's Department of Education. So moving on with a second bribe in the bill, quote, an LEA's allocated education funding shall not decrease from one year to the next year due to the disenrollment of students from the LEA. If an LEA's calculated TISA allocation decreases from the LEA's TISA allocation for the prior school year, then the department shall allocate additional funds to the LEA in in an amount such that the LEA's TISA allocation for the current year is not less than the prior school year, end quote. So what does all that mean? It means the county commissions won't have to find a way to make up for the losses from the state's education funding formula for children that are taken out of their public or government school systems by their parents because they accepted the bribe. It's convenient, right? Bribing the teachers, bribing the teachers unions, and bribing the county commissions for their support of this bill. A bill that would have our own state government also bribe the citizens, the parents, with taxpayer money so that these parents can purchase freedom from the government. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what you get from toxic and untruthful government leadership when you do not hold them accountable at the ballot box for their unconstitutional actions. You get more unconstitutional actions all of which erode your liberty. All right, that's it for this segment. When I come back from my closing thoughts, I'll also get into this dark movement from the commies that will will ultimately be a win-win for the conservative movement in our republic. So I'll be right back. Well, folks, that will do it for this week. Really, for the next few weeks. Again, please like, follow, or subscribe to my social media accounts, which can be found in the description of this video or audio podcast. Also, don't forget to leave a review or a thumbs up on this or every episode that you listen to. Follow my social media and blog to find out who the next show's guest will be. I'm very excited to bring this East Tennessee pastor on the program. For my closing thoughts, though, Let's discuss a couple of dark movements that emerged on the left in response to the election of, in their view, an existential threat to democracy, Donald Trump. The first term I want to tell you about is something raging across social media right now. Remember the 
Remember this phrase, aqua tofana. It is a phrase that dates back to the uh, 1600s in Italy and refers to a poison that women used to poison their abusers or their husbands. There are several videos on social media making reference to that term by liberal women and what they should do to their husbands, especially if they voted for Donald Trump, which is highly unlikely. It is dark because these women are advocating for political violence. Violence in the form of unaliving their husbands in retribution for their delusional perception that their rights are being removed by Trump. Of course, that is something the toxic and untruthful people in media and government leadership have been spreading throughout the election cycle, and it also could not be further from the truth. I would like one person to tell me a right that the government under Donald Trump will take away from them. Just one. Now, here's how it's a win-win for conservatives, though. Typically, liberal women aren't married to conservative men. So these women would be taking out liberal men like the white dudes for Harris. Not only removing them from the gene pool, but also the voter rolls. Additionally, by committing that felony, these liberal women would be voluntarily forfeiting their rights to freedom of movement, freedom of speech, and their right to vote. See, a win-win. The next movement, while not so dark, is the 4B movement sweeping social media right now. Again, this is coming from liberal women. After it was declared that Donald Trump won the election in an electoral landslide, as well as the national popular vote, these liberal women expressed interest in the 4B movement as a form of protest. The 4B movement, again, by liberal women, most of whom are blue-haired, overweight, unattractive, already single, with only a small prospect of any type of meaningful heterosexual relationship, the movement has these women partaking in the 4 no's because of their alternate universe view of what Donald Trump's presidency will be or mean to their rights. The four no's are no sex with men. Doesn't seem to be a problem for most of them already. No, no giving birth, no dating men. Again, that doesn't seem like it'll be an issue for many men, especially conservatives and no marriage with men. That's just a continuation of the third no. Anyway, once again, this is a win-win, I believe. It will mean that there won't be any of these blue-haired cat ladies chasing men around and having sex and getting pregnant. No unprotected sex even with the soy boys that would be willing to take them home and the bar's lights start flashing, telling them it's last call. If they stick to this uh, 4B movement, there will be less demand for abortions. That's a win. With less dating and less marriage and no sex and no pregnancies, it means their mental illness has no chance of being passed down genetically. A win. The rampant mental illness in that demographic comes because of decades of the toxic and untruthful leadership of the Democrat Party and their enablers. And since they are big believers in evolution and Darwinism, it appears they will be solving several problems with their Aqua Tafana and 4B movements. But since we know the commies and the mentally ill are not people of principles, we can assume these movements will not take hold and not come to fruition. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because of the toxic and untruthful leadership in many of our republic's institutions that we have arrived at this point in the trajectory of our country. The only way forward after the election of Donald Trump is to press harder in holding these people accountable that are in those leadership positions. As I said last week, let's put the pedal to the metal and continue to press every elected official to follow the rows and to say no to communism and no to any bill that seeks to erode the people's liberty, such as Governor Lee's latest attempt to bribe us Tennesseans with our own money to purchase freedom from an institution he and his cronies already control. This week's wisdom from God's word comes to us from the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 24. Whoever robs their father or mother and says it's not wrong is partner to one who destroys. That wisdom speaks to the heart of this week's show. Everywhere we turn lately, our government seeks to rob each of us, fathers and mothers, of our freedoms. We have had a sycophantic media that has supported the government's message of expansion and control. 
So not only do we need to hold elected officials accountable for their toxic and untruthful leadership at the ballot box, we need to do the same with the legacy mainstream media. Stop watching them and stop supporting them, which includes many of the companies that advertise on their networks. Seek out the new alternative media and support their sponsors. Our actions can relegate these tyrants and these supporters of tyrants to the ash heap of history. So until next week or the week of December 9th, stand in the arena with me. Reveille, it's time to wake up.